All right, so hi everybody. My name's Kate Hudson. Um, I'm a web engineer and I work on WebMaker at uh, the Mozilla Foundation. Um, I'm super way more comfortable writing Node and JavaScript than I am speaking to humans, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about diversity and I'm going to talk to you about contributors. Um, and most of you don't need convincing that this is a really important topic and we need to talk about it in open source. But when it comes to finding solutions and practically implementing them, um, which is what I'd like to address by the end of my talk, I think it's worth clarifying exactly what that means. So what do we mean by diversity and why is diversity so important, particularly to open source? Uh, so typically when we discuss diversity, we're talking about how we identify ourselves and how other people identify us. So you know, those can be qualities like gender, ethnicity, our belief systems, our shape, our color. Um, most of the discussion around diversity of identity, it's centered around things like power structures, politics, equity, rights, and communication. But uh, identity really matters, but it's not the only form of diversity. Uh, it's also important to recognize the existence of cognitive diversity, and that is the differences in terms of how we think and the experience and training that led us to think that way. So as a society, we're really interested in um, cognitive qualities that lead to creativity, innovation, higher performance that relate to individuals. But we're actually not talking so much about how being different can collectively lead to better outcomes. So that's why I wanted to share some research that I read pretty recently. Um, it's a book called The Difference, uh, and it was written by a really awesome guy named Scott Page. And the central premise of his research is that diversity trumps ability when it comes to creating great outcomes. So the first thing he does is define what cognitive diversity is. And I'm not going to read this whole slide. You can go and find the book if you want more information. But essentially, it's a difference in terms of our perspectives and how we use those to uh, construct different models and predictions and methods for finding solutions. So that's cognitive diversity. Um, he looked at problem-solving capabilities of high-performing but homogenous groups of thinkers compared to less experienced uh, but very diverse thinkers. And he found pretty conclusively that for certain kinds of problem solving, diverse groups performed much better. So this wasn't true for all tasks. Uh, routine tasks like flipping burgers and mechanical things, virtually no benefit. Uh, for tasks that had to be performed in isolation by individuals, like some of the early software development, uh, were better for um, individuals with experience. But the most benefit, be beneficial was disjunctive tasks, so group performance um, being disproportionately dependent on the strongest member in different cases. And that's really interesting because modern software development is to a large extent disjunctive. So for any particular problem um, in a set of problems, there's different cognitive abilities that will solve particular problems better. Um, and open source solutions rise to the top um, without being blocked by other uh, processes. And it allows for outliers to rise when they're needed, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah. Diversity of experience matters to open source. It's a perfect problem for diversity. And that's awesome. So now you guys have a pretty robust understanding of what diversity is and why it matters. Let's talk implementation. Um, so I'm going to show you some things you can do when you go back to your jobs that will help attract more contributors. And more importantly, maximize the value you get from those contributors. So let's start with code contributors. It's something we know. Um, so cognitive diversity is really important for good engineering. We learned that already uh, because it's uh, largely a, a disjunctive uh, process. And it's really important to remember that individuals who may not have the same domain experience uh, uh, will actually come up with better solutions to certain problems. That's not true of all problems. It's not probably going to be true for like re-architecting some of your um, app, but it's going to be interesting for like new problems that nobody knows how to solve. 
So how do we support different areas of expertise without slowing contributors down and ourselves as core contributors? One of the best ways is to make um, uh, reducing dependencies on domain knowledge and project history. So one way you can do that is by splitting your code base into modules. So if you have like a huge le legacy code base and it's impossible to fix all the docs at once, consider releasing part of it as modules. So one of the things we did on the WebMaker project is we decided to take all of our style and CSS, um, put it on a Bootstrap API, and release it as a separate module so that contributors who are interested in contributing to um, just like our UI and our style could actually hack on that without setting up our crazy stack with Redis and MongoDB and all that stuff. Um, so another consequence of cognitive diversity is that communicating and decision making becomes way more difficult. Uh, you already know this because there's already a huge diversity of opinions um, in your open source projects and you have to be really, really mindful about how that affects newcomers. Um, I can't tell you how to be an expert in uh, with dealing with conflict. If you missed Jen's talk uh, a couple of days ago on emotional safety, I highly recommend you check it out. But another thing you can do is consider a code of conduct. Um, so code of conducts have been in use for a while, especially with events in the event space. Um, what they do is they help resolve conflicts, uh, they make people feel safe, um, and they're coming into the space of code contribution too. So one example of this is um, Mozilla has community participation guidelines. They're pretty broad. They cover all kinds of contribution. They're really good guidelines for dealing with new members. You can take a look at that. Um, but another project that I recently came across that we're trying to um, incorporate into our code base is the contributor code of conduct, uh, which is something that is intended to be uh, closer to your files on GitHub, so something alongside contributor MD. And it talks about specific behaviors and GitHub issues and dealing with code contributions specifically. So uh, there's a couple of projects that are already using it. Angular is one of them. If you want to check it out, fork it, contribute, definitely take a look at that link. OK, let's get some water. All right, so code contribution is awesome. Um, and so now we know how to equip our code for a better place for newcomers. But I think it's also critical that we expand our definition of contributor. And this is really what I want to talk about the most, is taking advantage of the full range of human talent that's available to us. So like, that's pretty stupid, right? I mean, assuming that the only part of, uh, our, of what we're working on can improve from collaborative iteration is code is completely ludicrous. Even if you're writing a library that's like really technical, I think uh, what you're doing can definitely benefit from contributors that have skills other than your own. So the first thing I want to talk about um, that's extremely relevant to software develop it, uh, development that you can get contributors is user research. And how many people know what user research is? Yay, sort of, lots of people. Um, so I'm going to talk about specifically a kind of user research called user testing. Um, and basically what that is is does my software work the way I expect it to? And I got to tell you, based on what we've done with user research, um, it often doesn't. Um, so again, the idea here is to rely on people who have more expertise and access to communities that are valuable to you to do the user testing for you. What you have to do first is to write tests that are relevant to your project so that they can actually hold user testing. So how does that look? look? It kind of looks like testing, but not. Um, you kind of write down some expectations about new features that are landing or problems you're seeing. Uh, you do the implementation and then you run user testing or get your contributors to do it uh, to see if your expectations were right. These are um, some examples of what tests look like. So there's user stories, scenarios where you um, have users pretend they're doing something, and expectations like what will happen when you click on something. Um, I think expectations are particularly relevant to library developers um, in the case of error states. So even if you're not doing like front-facing UI, you can run user testing on developers to see if, you know, when they get an error state, are, are they understanding what the error is. So like those are some examples of what you could use if you were testing Bower about, you know, you could run the error, have the user complete some um, actions and ask them what they think happened. Did they actually understand what the error was saying? And that would be really cool for new contributors to try doing. Do things fail in the way you expect them to? 
So some tips, um, help contributors choose the right target audience. It's really awesome to take advantage of contributors' different communities that you may not have access to, but it's also really important to say which users are not relevant. Like, you wouldn't want to go to a group of kindergartners and test Bower error messages. Like, that would not be that helpful. Um, the other thing is you only need around five sessions to make it really valuable. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you don't have to expect your contributors to do thousands of surveys or anything like that. Um, we found that user testing done by community provided different interpretations and areas of focus, even with the same test, than our core team. So I think it's really cool because it's in the spirit of taking advantage of cognitive diversity and finding out what people care about. Okay. So next. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, so the next thing is localization. Um, so. I actually tried to figure out how to pronounce that word in German to make it really, you know, awesome, but I don't know. So if anybody speaks German, you should teach me how to say that after. Um, so to demonstrate this principle, um, I'm going to look at a contributor pathway that um, we've actually had a lot of successful uh, work with my team, and that's localization. How many people know what localization is? A lot of people. Okay, how many people actually um, ha have implemented localization in their project? And how do people feel like they're doing it really successfully? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's a hard problem. Um, so that's why I want to talk about it. I feel like, uh, so localization, for those of you who don't know what it is, uh, it's making your project or your product available in different languages or locales. Um, and much deeper than that, it's making uh, your software available um, that, in a way that's culturally meaningful or changing your UI to make it more relevant for particular cultures. Um, so I'm going to talk about a specific process that we did localization that made it honestly like really easy for us to localize all of our materials. And it was uh, an extremely um, valuable process for us. So the first thing you have to do is um, we, were looking, we started by looking at the accept language header, which is something that all browsers send with requests uh, to your application. Um, and that helps you guess like what the browser settings are. Um, it's not perfect, but it's a good start. Uh, for example, in client-side applications, there's varying implementations of navigator.language, so you may have to rely on other things to determine language. Uh, the next thing you have to do is uh, have some kind of user control over what language. For example, we have uh, like the locale as part of our routing. Um, having some UI for users to choose what language is, honestly not that hard, just a way to detect language. Um, the next thing you have to do is figure out a way to include uh, localization functions in your templating language, whatever that is. So this example is from Angular. Basically, you just have a function that converts a list of strings like this in a JSON file um, that's keyed on some word, so hello jsconf, and a function called get text, to re get text to replace that with the locale specific string. And it's like honestly pretty easy. And finally, this is the part where you get the contributors. Um, we uploaded all of our, we have like an automatic system to upload all of our JSON files to TransFX, which is a continuous localization platform. Um, and it basically allows users to look at each string and some notes about it and translate it into their language. Um, the interesting thing here is we didn't actually have to invent this system to get localizers to work with us. We actually used existing communities and existing systems. We went to them, which was, Less work for us. Um, libraries can be localized too. So just because you don't have like a full uh, user-facing app doesn't mean you can't localize um, your material. Moment.js, which is like a, a date and time library, uh, uses a strategy to like set language and include localized versions of date and time. So you can also do that too. So the results of this for our project is that um, WebMaker in production is translated into 18 languages um, in full, and it, there's 100, over 100 languages in process. So that's our, um, our dashboard. And if you see there, we've got 1,057 contributors on a fairly new project. That's 1,057 contributors. Um, that is a non-trivial amount of people that care about your project and are actively contributing to it. Ooh, thank you. And I have to say, seeing people in different countries with um, using our tools, in, uh, that, where our tools are the only one of that 
tool in their language is like an amazing thing to see. So besides it being really valuable for us to get that translation, we also learned some unique things from going through the localization process. Uh, this is our um, HTML5 video editor, uh, Popcorn Maker. We found that when we translated into Arabic, we realized that we had to actually adjust our CSS and our UI to be on the right-hand side. We learned that we had to deal with variable string length, so we couldn't make fixed elements. Um, we, we went through a whole process of learning um, that we would never have done if we hadn't have localized our apps. Um, so yeah, the key insight here is instead of thinking about always having to mentor and make work for your contributors, ask contributors to teach you like, what they're experts at and bring them in that way. Okay. So these things that I showed you, localization, user research, um, may not be relevant to you. But one thing you can do when you go back to your uh, job on Monday and you're working on your open source projects is take a list of possible blind spots that you have on your project that aren't necessarily related to code and make specific asks to communities about how they can help contribute to your project. You know, maybe you need accessibility experts to help do QA. Maybe you need copywriters to help work through your docs. Um, maybe you need more animated GIFs, I don't know. Um, there's experts in every field, uh, take advantage of them. So now you know a little bit more about what cognitive diversity is and uh, how you can use it um, when uh, you don't know how to take advantage of certain things in your code base. Um, but if there's one thing that I want you to take away from this talk, it would be this. Making good software is really fucking hard. And it's going to be even, <laughs> yeah, right? It's, it's really hard. And it's going to be even harder for the open source community to deliver really great products in the future, you know, 10 years from now. So we can't afford not to take advantage of this awesome thing that is cognitive diversity. So let's go make it work. Thank you. Thank you.